Welcome to episode 216 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Prue and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, the Bruins have made some moves since we last spoke. They signed uh, former Harvard captain John Farinacci to a two-year entry-level contract at an attempt to try to bolster the, the organizational depth at center. We'll discuss his potential at the NHL level and in, in, in that going forward. And they also signed um, NHL veteran uh, Alex Chase on to a professional tryout. So those are the more recent transactions. And um, how are you guys? And I think those are probably the, the two jumping points we'll start off with today. Yeah, uh, I am good. Um, yeah, just create more and more competition. Uh, in Chase's case for NHL jobs, obviously – just a PTO, so you're not really committing anything to him in terms of cap space or contracts yet. But obviously, you know he'll get a chance to to compete for and potentially win a job, likely in in the bottom six. You know, I think you could see him as a third or fourth liner. He's also been something of a power play specialist for at least the last several years. Um, last season, he scored six goals in, in just 20 games for Detroit. And five of them were on the power play uh, in total over the last five years. 30 of his 61 NHL goals have been on the power play. He's kind of made a living right around the, the net front. Um, so you could see him get a chance there for the Bruins. You know, I think especially if you're thinking about, you know, if, if James Van Riemsdyk plays that spot in the first unit, maybe it's Chase on the second unit if he can do enough other things to, to win a spot on the roster. Um, and then Farinacci create, you know, again, how many times have we talked about it, but the Bruins have to keep taking swings at center. Um, and this is one, you know, he's, he's a good two way player. He's, he's a really smart player. I know Bridget's seen more of him in college, uh, covering Yale games, um, mm -hmm. in their matchups against Harvard. But, you know, I think there is some offensive upside there. He, he missed time last year due to injury early on then came back and averaged over a point per game. So there's, you know, a little bit of offense there. And if you're the Bruins, I think you hope he can tap into that a little bit more, but um, at the very least, like he's another guy who could be competing for a roster spar, whether it's this year, next year, whenever you just, you know, you're taking swings. You're, you're giving yourselves as many cracks to find guys who can help you at the center ice position going forward. Yeah, and to speak for the to the Farinacci stuff, because I broadcast one of his games this year. Um, he right after he came back from his injury, actually, it was I think seven days after his first game. Harvard came and played Yale, um, and he like in, in case people hear, oh, he had an injury that kept him out for the first half of last year's um, collegiate hockey season. He looked fine, like right away. He didn't seem to have any rust at all. Um, he played really well. He centered the top power or actually he might not because he was just coming back i think he might have played wing on the top power play unit but he can center a top power play unit um at least at the collegiate level um so he's all, always been on over the last two seasons on harvard's top power play unit and he was their second line center when he came back and he um when he started to come back from injury and he, it's not like the Bruins are signing. He's not an undrafted free agent. He's a drafted free agent. He was originally drafted by Arizona um, 76 overall. So that's a third round pick uh, in 2019. And he let, I was talking to Scott before we started the podcast um, to just try to make sure I had the logistics right. But four seasons after or four years after you're drafted, if you don't sign with that team, you become a free agent. So his time, uh, came up this summer because he was drafted in the summer of 2019 and he decided he didn't want to go to Arizona. So it's not like this guy is just, you know, he's, he was uh, picked by the Coyotes as an NHL level player and decided he wanted to sign closer to where he's playing his been playing in college, which is with the Bruins. So um, we think it was mostly his decision to not end up signing with the team that drafted him, but it's not like you're getting someone that uh, kind of went under the radar. He was picked up by the Coyotes originally. What was that, Scott? <laughs> um, <laughs> the Melvin, Melvin. Um, so 
So Farinacci was also part of that um, that Trevor Zegris uh, World Juniors team that won gold a couple of years ago during during COVID, and he played a pretty significant role in that team uh, as far as point production and whatnot. And so that's that tournament can be a good indicator if somebody not always, but can be a good indicator if somebody has the potential at the next level. Is is Farinacci somebody? And, and Bridget, you mentioned he was a drafted free agent, not an undrafted free agent, but is he somebody? that his game can translate to the NHL level. Does he have does he have the speed that can help him excel at the NHL level? Or do you think there's a there's a greater chance than not that maybe he's just one of those players, great two way player in college, third round pick, maybe he cracks the NHL as like a fourth liner. Is there is there a potential middle six upside to this kid, whether it's not necessarily this coming season, but down the line. I mean, they'd sign it for two years, so we'll start there. Can I answer first? So I would say that when I watched him, his style of play was, um, like Scott mentioned, he was a really smart center. So like a very aware of – I don't want to compare him to Krejci because I've said on several other podcasts that Krejci's his own. Like there's no one's really all that like Krejci. Um, but in terms of like his hockey IQ, um, really, really smart – center he's coming from harvard i know that sounds like it it might be a given but um when you just watch him out there uh though i i'm not sure about this year him being ready to contribute uh, a lot of minutes i'm not sure he ends up with boston he more than likely wouldn't you think ends up with providence but um who is to say he's well i think he's 22 years old um, and he's got time to develop and maybe their center, their center, uh, configuration with Zaka and Coyle and, uh, whoever else they throw in, in their third line center, whether it be Frederick or geeky. And, um, however, that bottom part of the center structure works out, he could win a spot. I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he really challenged for a spot because he plays, a good fundamental style of hockey. He's not somebody that I really can recall getting exposed too much defensively. So, I mean, he, he's got, he's got a chance to make the team out of camp. I think. Yeah. I think he also plays with some physicality and like, he'll get to dirty areas and not afraid to mix it up. So you like that, especially if you're talking about, you know, a fourth liner bottom six guy, uh, really good on faceoffs. He won 54.8% of his faceoffs last year. Um, you know, I know played in, in all situations at Harvard. So, you know, you look at, he probably isn't going to play in Bruins power play anytime soon, but if he were able to crack, you know, say the fourth line contribute on the penalty kill, I think that's something that'd be in play. Um, so yeah, he's, by the way, he's also the nephew of Ted Donato. So like there's another Bruins connection, obviously Harvard connection, uh, being coached by him. Um, but yeah, so I think that there's a lot to like there. I, I, Brian, you mentioned speed. I think that's probably, you know, when you read up on him, like considered sort of the question mark that he's going to need to work on. But that's a lot of young players. That's pretty much everyone who comes out of college. You know, very few guys have NHL level skating or they probably wouldn't have stayed, you know, until four years after being drafted. Um, uh, you mentioned that World Junior team. He, he really played on the, he was like the third line center on that team, but had five goals in seven games. So contributed, you know, not to Trevor Zegers levels, obviously Zegers was like setting world junior records that tournament. Um, but was a pretty significant offensive contributor, even as third line center. So, you know, I don't, I would say, you know, my projection is like, he could potentially have third line upside if, you know, more, more offense comes along and, and translates to the pro level. I don't know if he has top six upside. I, I think there would have to be like a really big offensive jump for that to happen, but you can definitely see him as a contributor in, a, in the bottom six. You know, I think talk, there's almost, I think maybe some similarities to, to Mark McLaughlin when he came out of college where it's like, he just does everything well and smart player and, you know, plays all situations. Like those are guys you just like having because, they can compete for jobs. They're not going to be out of place if you put them in an NHL game, right? They're not going to get exposed. They're not 
going to be out there making stupid plays. Um, I will say, though, I think he does have more offensive upside than McLaughlin. Um, McLaughlin is, I believe, bigger um, and can and can uh, use that to his advantage. But I I do think Farinacci is a different style center than McLaughlin. Um, and I don't I, I kind of feel like he automatically jumps McLaughlin in the depth chart. Um, maybe just because I have recency bias. I saw him play at Harvard this past season and really liked how he played. But there's a chance that he just jumped several of these guys we've been talking about in Providence in the depth chart. And it could this could end up being a move where, that we look back on and we're like, wow, that seemed in, insignificant at the time. But look, like two years down the line, three years down the line, or you know, if they extend him because they only sent him to a two-year contract. Um, if he starts en- ending up being a contributor and he's jumped those um, players at center in the depth chart, then you're like, wow, that was actually a really good depth move that has turned into more of a regular everyday kind of a player. And I, I don't see that as off the table for him. Yeah. May, maybe potentially more all around offense for Farinacci. I'd say McLaughlin, especially coming out of college, definitely had more goal scoring chops, um, you know, had 21 goals in 33 games as, as a senior. I do think fair from, you know, just a little bit I've watched, like I do think Farinacci has a pretty good shot. And we mentioned the, five goals and seven games at world juniors um, just seems like maybe he needs to use it more. Like, yeah, I don't, you know, might be a little bit of a, you know, pass first type player, which is fine. But I think if, you know, if we're talking about like what's his offensive upside at some point, he's probably going to have to use a shot more. Yeah. But you want a distributor too. Like you'll take a good puck distributor. And I'd, I'd say you're right that he's more of a, assist manufacturer than he is a guy that's looking to shoot first. But I, I do think that he has the skill set. We'll see whether or not it can transition into immediately into NHL, but more like I feel more likely than not he starts out in the in the AHL. Um but you know what he's on a Harvard team and he was um like I mentioned on the first line or the first power play unit. He had played back and forth between the first and second line. Um for the Crimson. And this wasn't on a team. Like you you think of college hockey teams are such a wide range of like, like I broadcast for Yale. They had no drafted players. Harvard had a lot of drafted players, a lot of really, really good players on that team. And he's getting, and he's getting those first power play unit shifts and top six um, minutes for a team like that, that has NHL talent on the roster. So it's not like he's the best player on a team that there's only two drafted guys. Like he was getting that ice time, obviously as the captain, as a veteran, but he's competing against guys that are NHL draft picks for that time. Yeah, I think it, I think if people are wondering if Farinacci could be a diamond in the rough top six replacement for a couple of the guys that Bruins just lost, I think the answer is no. Not to you know put a damper on somebody's NHL potential, but I just don't think that's the type of player that he is. I think you guys have been pretty bang on with your assessment of him. I think that he's a. I think I think the, what the Bruins like about him is that he's a. He has a lot of intangibles in a player that they like as far as work ethic and smarts and IQ, like you guys mentioned, and those things do matter. Um, but I don't think that he's that he's any sort of, you know, like I said, diamond in the rough top six replacement for some of the centers they just lost in Bergeron and Krejci. But again, it's never it's it's competition's always a good thing and, and, and organizational depth is always a good thing. So it's definitely a a, a, a definitely a worthwhile signing. And Bridget, you said uh, a good point. Like it does seem somewhat ins- in, insignificant. I, I know people have been in favor of this, but I, I honestly think that sometimes people just say what other people say. I don't, I think a lot of Bruins fans that are a big fan of the Farinacci signing probably haven't watched much of John Farinacci because where do you even find Harvard hockey? So um, oh, I, I think that you. I could tell you, I almost went back and watched <laughs> the tape did. from <laughs> like, I have it on my computer. You can watch it on ESPN plus I'll be there. <laughs> but the, uh no, I mean, my point is like, yeah, it's, I, I don't think, I think people are being a little ins- insincere if they, if they're pretending that they're very well versed in him as a player overall. But mm-hmm. I, I think that um, to your point, Bridget, it might seem insignificant, but it could, it could pay dividends um, 
as soon as this year, maybe the year afterwards. And, and like I said, they signed it to a two-year deal, so we'll start with that. Yeah, and, and they also, we've, we've mentioned that they have no cap space to go out there and try to find someone that is already an established NHL player. Um, and this is a seemingly very low-risk decision to add him. Um, and you almost feel like they might have locked out a little bit because once he becomes a free agent, then he gets to choose where he wants to go and he wants to come to Boston. So um, like say he ruled out a lot of other teams and he just decided he wanted to come here because you mentioned the ties with the Donatos and um, coming to Harvard and um, for whatever reason, wanting to come to the Bruins organization, thinking that maybe he has a chance here and that he'd be a fit here. So there's, there's a chance that this is kind of a you locked out situation because if you wanted to come here, you weren't really competing for him. You didn't have to give him a huge contract, obviously. Um, he is just coming straight out of college. So there is n- very little risk in doing this. So that's probably why you'll get a, a general consensus of this was a good move because it doesn't hurt anything. I mean, he could play in Providence and not like a, not affect anything. It could just be a depth move or um, – best case scenario maybe you you need him at some point to fill in on your third or fourth line at some point this season if there's an injury or if one of your other free agent signings doesn't work out say Boquist or Geeky or someone that you brought in that you thought was gonna give you like you thought that they were gonna be a better fit maybe they're not and maybe that's when you have to elevate someone from Providence and Farinacci is another guy that you could uh, take a look at there yeah, and we talked to him late last week on Zoom after the signing, and he set he basically said that he was like, "Yeah, I talked to a few other teams, but nothing could really compare to to the opportunity to sign with the Bruins." Um, he was considered the top uh, drafted player to reach free agency this summer. Uh, you know, it was like him and Jay O'Brien from BU, who was actually a first round pick of the Flyers four years ago, but. Um, had a good season this past year, but like didn't really pan out in terms of, you know, l- offensively looking like a, a first rounder. Um, I think Farinacci has the stronger all around game. And so that's why he was widely considered, you know, the sort of the prize of like this group of guys who waited out um, to get to August free agency. Usually this drafted free agency period isn't, as deep as the undrafted free agency that happens, you know, right when the college season ends. Um, But, you know, every now and then good players get here. And, you know, like I, I mentioned to these guys before, that's how the Bruins got Blake Wheeler back in the day. He waited it out. Didn't sign the team that drafted him. Uh, Recently, you know, Jimmy Vesey was a notable one that actually, um, you know, led to something of a bidding war where there was actually like real money being thrown around, and also Harvard, also Harvard, uh, yeah, college hockey player. Again, you know, s- smart guys who kind of know their situation. You know, realize that they maybe have more options than just signing with the team that drafts them. Um, you know, Visa can also serve as like a little bit of a cautionary tale in terms of you know, like Brian said, like not getting too excited. Where you know everyone was stoked about VZ and wanted their team to sign them. And he's had a nice NHL career, no dissing VZ, but it's not like he turned into a first line forward, which I think some people who were getting too excited at the time thought he might be. And, um, but yeah, so keep expectations in check, but certainly a a useful signing that can potentially help you. Um, Did you guys want to transition to Chieson since he's maybe the one that has more of a chance to make the NHL roster this year. Um, you know, we, we touched on him a little, but you know, 32 years old has been around the NHL for a while, has had a couple good seasons. He had a 22 goal season with Edmonton, won a Stanley cup with Washington in, in 2018 and played 16 games during that playoff run. So it's not like he was just a spectator or extra forward. Like he was actually in their lineup in a fourth line role. So, um, you know, I, I covered Chieson in, in college at BU, and uh, I thought he was going to have, you know, a solid chance at like a pretty long NHL career just because he, he does a lot of things well and he has a size. He's six foot four. And we talked about how he's kind of carved out that net front role in the power play. Um, but I think when you look at like this Bruins bottom six and you see, 
you know, that they have so many different options now that some guys with size, some guys with speed, um, some guys who, you know, defense is their specialty. Now you bring in a chase on who can make things happen around the net front. And it's like, they're going to have a lot to figure out, but they definitely have options of just different looks and guys who, who bring some different things to the table that I think creates, creates a really interesting competition that chase on now joins. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's funny. I, I for some reason, uh, when when uh, free agency happened and, and and Don Sweeney was just signing a couple of just random players like Kevin Shattenkirk, Milan Lucic, I, I saw I saw Alex Chason's name like in like the the free agency like just availability and tracker or whatnot, and I just had a feeling that he was going to end up in in Boston because because he is a player who like he does bring good value like on the power play, like you said, Scott, like net front. Big body again, as you said, he's not he's not really a massive game changer, but he's a but when the Bruins are trying to just find different little pieces to the puzzle on the cheap this year to help them stay competitive and and, and build towards the playoffs, I just kind of felt like he was the type of player that they might they might target. And then you know whatever it was like two months, a month and a half goes by, and 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 they actually do end up signing him. And but um. Yeah, it's it's bargain shopping is what they're doing, and you know he he did he did have a you know he he has experience in Edmonton uh, on that power play unit. Um, I don't know if he was there on their first unit with those guys at times, but but he was definitely on a high powered offensive team. He got power play time is my is my point. Whether it was the first or second unit, so he has value there. I, I have no issue with the signing. I mean. I just think the Bruins are in a situation where they they know where they're deficient right now, at least on paper, and they're just trying to they're trying to fill in the rest of the holes um, to complete the team as as best as they can. I think Chase on, I have no problem with the signing. I, I, he does he doesn't bringing him in on a PTO, like it does not hurt anything at all. Yeah, and and should mention as well that he you know, one of the reasons that he gets linked to the Bruins is because he's been linked to them in the past. Like he's, he's a player they've reportedly had interest in, with in, in the past. Um, at one point there were rumors of like a trade, like a DeBrusque for chase on deal when he was in Edmonton, which I never thought made any sense and, and obviously never happened and shouldn't have happened unless there were other pieces involved. But yeah, like he has, he has popped up before. So, you know, you every now and then there are these plays where you're like, oh yeah, that absolutely makes sense that he ended up with the Bruins because you figure they've probably been in touch in the past or you know knew there was some interest there or whatever. Yeah, I remember I remember him being connected to the Bruins a few times, and also um, you get this far into free agency after you know the Bruins make a splash in the beginning of it with signing all the pieces we mentioned, Van Rien, Steig, Shat, and Kirk, Lucci again. Um, but then you have someone like Chase on who he's still around, like he stuck around, nobody picked him up. And that's why he's not a uh, signing. He's a tryout. Um, so it was kind of like, okay, well, we'll, this is a really low risk um, thing to invite you to try out for a spot, play in preseason, see where you are, that way they get a chance to evaluate him before they commit any money to him if they want to, or if they don't, if they see a spot that he can fit, or maybe they don't see a fit for him at all. And, you know, it was just a tryout and he's gone and on his way and maybe somebody else gives him a look, but I mean, it, it's another really incredibly low risk or even I would say no risk move to extend him this offer, this, this paid tryout. Um, and you know we'll we'll get a better look at him to see how he how his health is how he compares to some of the other guys who are younger who are faster um, and it seems like the Bruins just have so many pieces to try to plug in and figure out where they're going that they're just going to get a look at everything and and they wanted to see what Chase on if he actually after all this time and after all these times they've thought about bringing him in actually would have fit the way they would they expected him to, or, or they were hoping he would. Yeah. And, and I know one of the takes that some people have is like, why do they keep bringing in all these veterans? You know, they're going to block some of the kids from getting a chance. And it's like, no, they're not like 
those kids are still going to get every opportunity to win a job. And if they outperform Alex Chieson in camp, you know what the Bruins are going to do? They're just not going to sign Chieson to a contract and they'll let him explore other opportunities. Like it's, it's fine. It, I've said it before. Like even Patrick Brown, Jesper Boquist guys, you know, AJ Greer for that matter, guys who have actual contracts. If one of these youngsters beat or two or three of them beat those guys out and they're just straight up better in training camp and preseason, like they're going to get jobs. The Bruins aren't, attached to any of those guys for big money or years so like in that sense it's not even comparable to last year like what we were talking about with Felino or Nosek when you know obviously it was a good thing the Bruins kept them around but in camp we were saying you know those guys had kind of tough preseasons but in those cases like there was actual money attached there that like you you had to work around or figure out if you weren't going to keep them in this case like these contracts are all under a million dollars like it's not it's nothing if if the Bruins just decide, hey, you know what, gave it a shot, but uh, you know we're going with the we're going with the kid. Like y- you don't lose anything. You don't have to worry about burying it in Providence. Like it's it's very easy money to just dump off the books. Yeah, and and also, <laughs> oh sorry, stop ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> um yeah, and he's in a also mood today, like I'll he's, tell you, he is in a freaking mood today. Get out of here. For what, for what it's worth, um, you know, Tayson has two hundred thirty three uh, NHL points to his name in the regular season. You know, if he's a guy on, on your fourth line, I mean, there's not a ton of fourth liners out there with two hundred thirty three points in, or, or or whatever that equivalent would be. Like he's got. My point is, he's got some pop to his game. Um, if he's a, if he's a if he's a cheap fourth line option that can help you on a, on PP two, then great. But yeah, as you mentioned, Scott, like he's not going to his, his, his presence on a, on a tryout basis is not going to, you know, prevent a, a, a Merkulov or a Lysel or a, you know, Beecher or, you know, who you go, just whoever you feel like is, could be vying for a full-time position. Those guys still have those opportunities. So, and you uh, want to know what this is completely like? It's a, it's a complete side point. But did you see what the Bruins put up of Lysel back in in Sweden? I don't know if you saw any of the stuff on their social media. Um, and he was with Axelson, right? They were they were out um, doing a few little things in the community, and and Axelson was showing him around some of the stuff. It, and I believe it was Gutenberg, which is I think that's where Lysel's from. So. Um, yeah, they had him. They had they were featuring Lysel and some of their social media stuff this week. I think it was on the the Bear Tracks uh, stuff they do throughout the summer. But um, it was just kind of ni- nice to see this new Swedish kid coming up through this through the Bruins. And then he was talking to Axelson, who obviously is probably their most well known Swedish former Swedish player. Who, by the way, he's a scout, is he not? Yeah, he's there. He's the Bruins' lead European scout, so he's had a huge role in like all these Swedish draft picks they've made in recent years, um, including Lysel. Like he, you know, when when and you remember at the time there was like that weird thing that I, I think it was Butcher Gross who hinted at it during the draft that there was like some sort of off ice issue or whatever, and um, Axelson knew as well as anyone like exactly what was going on with them because he was on the ground and actually like at a lot of those games in Sweden. So um, definitely like a a lot, there was a high level of comfort there for the Bruins because, because of Axelson, because, you know, he not only sees all those kids, but in many cases already knows them, like already has a relationship with them. And yeah, it was, it was cool to see, to watch that because it was like, it literally just seemed like Axelson was part of his family. <laughs> like, yeah, like Lysel's like, here's my mom, my dad, my sister, and here's PJ. And like, yeah. he's just hanging out. <laughs> it was cute too. And it was like, was that, did the place that they were with all of the Bruins gear, was that owned by Axelson? Cause they're at this like bar area that was, it was a full Bruins themed bar or whatever it was and it had all sort of um bruins paraphernalia mostly axles and stuff like swedish bruins was kind of the the theme in in all of the memorabilia they had in the background it was kind of cool i was like oh that's weird you walk in there it looks like something you walk into in boston not gutenberg sweden 
Yeah, I don't I don't think he owns it. I, I'm, he might have something to do with it, but yeah, I'm I'm assuming it's just because there was probably that cuz that was in his hometown. I'm assuming there's just a large you know, population there that became Bruins fans because because of Axelson and because of how long he was with the Bruins. So, yeah, that that was kind of cool to see. He, like you'll see those pop up kind of just different places because you know, Boston sports fans are so crazy and it's like anywhere that there's a little bit of a transplant community or, you know, um, or just like a group of Boston sports fans. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you'll see those, those Boston sports bars just pop up all over the world. So yeah, that was kind of cool. To, Cause it wasn't even just Bruins. Like it had Patriots stuff, Red Sox, yeah. like it, it had everything. And that's funny. Cause that's actually where my family's from in Sweden too. So like, not my like parents, but my mom's uh, grandma. That's where she's from. So it's just kind of funny. Yeah, that 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 post you were mentioning, Bridget. I just checked it out, and um, and yeah, I mean, it, the the encouraging news is that he seems to be putting on some um some much needed muscle and and size, which I think is imperative for him to to get a sniff at the NHL level. And I think that you know that, that's obviously a point of emphasis for him in his development. Um, he has all the skill sets, and then you know, just getting more comfortable as a pro and then obviously gaining that size and strength is important for him. And also, you know, if I'm Lysel, not that he is privy to, you know, the, the top 50 prospect list or whatever um, that Scott brought up a few months ago, but I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's probably gotten wind that, you know, in the hockey community, his stock might be down after last year. And if, and if I'm him, not only am I focused on trying to make the Bruins, but I'm trying to, you know, prove people wrong. And I think he should probably come into camp with a fire under his ass. And I think I'm looking forward to seeing if he can take advantage of an opportunity opportunity this fall. Yeah, for sure. You're right. Like, I think there was another ranking that just came out recently that had him like 72nd, which isn't, isn't a bad place to be. Like if you're one of the hundred best prospects in hockey, I think that's pretty good, but it's not top 50. It's not top 30. So, um, yeah, you know, I think it, talking to him at uh, rookie camp, he certainly sounded like someone who was taking that approach of, you know, he knows last season, especially the second half, didn't go how he wanted and, you know, had like a plan of attack for how to how to get better and how to avoid having that happen again. So, yeah, now yeah. it's about putting that into action and, and getting strong as part of it. And you're right, there was, you know, during that video, like, Axelson says like looks like you've you've been lifting or bench pressing or whatever and like you know gives him like a little slap to the chest <laughs> yeah well I once again will encourage anybody who hasn't listened to it to go back we had an episode that Scott was able to get an interview with Fabian Lysel earlier in the summer so if you didn't listen to it um that might give you some context to what we're what we're talking about when we, when he comes up in conversation but what he was mentioning like what was positive that I took away from what he was saying about his game plan for how he was going to try to not have what happened last year happen again this year was that he definitely was honest with his assessment of himself and how his season went and was able to pinpoint what needed to change and what needed to get better. And Brian, you mentioned the size, but the main thing that he brought up was uh, he got worn out and maybe that's more endurance training. Maybe that's, um, better conditioning to the point or, and also huge part would be recovery, learning how to properly recover after games, because he felt like by the time that world juniors came around, he was, he was not recovered. He was not a hundred percent. He had just got burnt out. So, um, now that he's in the Bruins organization and has had time this summer to talk to different trainers and whatnot, like I'm sure they gave him ways to, help himself recover um, as well as to try to put on that weight. But um, he, he, he did look a little bigger in those videos, which was um, I guess encouraging to see that he's heading on the right track. We mentioned that part of the summer, he wasn't able to do any contact um, training because, or skating because he has was dealing with a concussion, but now he's past that and he can, you know, kind of get back on track to, training like any other guy in the off season. Yeah. And, you know, if you remember back to David Pasternak's rookie year, 
he uh, he wasn't the size he is now. So you can break into the league when you're not completely fully, you know, developed uh, strength strength wise. But he you got to be at a certain level, and I think that he seems to be at least at at, at a level where he can break into the league for sure. Um, Scott, did you have any closing thoughts on Lysel? Did you want to move on to um, some of the other topics you wanted to get to? Uh, no, I think I'm I'm good to move on. We can keep keep things over in Europe uh, because David Krejci did an interview with an outlet back home in Czechia. Um, the interview is in Czech, so we have to rely on Google Translate. Um, I I did tell Bridget via text that I'm fluent in Czech now, but uh, yeah, that, that's, I said, that's not when? actually true. Since when? No. <laughs> Last I spoke to um, you, I don't I didn't think you could, but wow, that was quick. Yeah, so Krejci did an interview with the outlet is iSport.cz, um, where he talked about all three of his, his NHL coaches, obviously Claude Julian, Bruce Cassidy, Jim Montgomery, and talked quite a bit about Cassidy and had mostly really good things to say, which you know I think will be the part that gets ignored. But he did say that they had a great relationship, called him a really great guy off the ice who understands hockey very well said he's definitely one of the best coaches in the NHL. But he also said he still has regrets over what happened in 2019 and specifically Cassidy's decision or handling of his right wing situation and who he got to play with. Um, And, you know, basically like Krejci openly wonders what would have happened if maybe they had changed things up, especially in the cup final. And, you know, if he got knock on his wing um the quote again through google translate so this is you know was originally in check gets translated i think he could have thrown the three away meaning marsha and berger and Pasanak, really i think that just means split them up and given me a little help that and the team in 2019 we went to the finals i had over 70 points in the season without starting for a long time with pasta if cassie has seen it a little differently back then and kind of trails off Later on, he says, I just think he could have been more accommodating. That time he put Carson Kuhlman on the wing for the seventh final, meaning game seven of the Stanley Cup final. An excellent player and a guy, but I would expect him to put someone who has played in the NHL for a longer time on my line. Carson played on the farm most of the time in the minors. So um, it's not necessarily that, like, that this is new. We've kind of heard this. The, the first time he left the Bruins and went over to Czechia, we heard you know, that he wishes he had been possible not more, but this does kind of drive right at the specific situation, which is the 2018, 19 season. And specifically that, that cup run, um, you know, I want to get you guys reactions to that. Obviously but I would just note that, you know, even if Cassidy puts Pasternak on his line, there's still an opening next to Bergeron and Marshan because that team was a top six right wing short, no matter how you slice it. So, there's a hole somewhere, but there's certainly merit to the idea of trying to change something up. Because if you remember in that cup final, Krejci had a relatively quiet series. He only had two points. And the Bergeron line was kind of, you know, most of the time losing its head-to-head matchups against Ryan O'Reilly. So um, second-guessing always easy, but it, clearly something that Krejci still thinks about. Yeah, well, it's funny because obviously he's been reflecting on his career and Bergeron has, but even just the entire team after what transpired uh, losing in the first round of this season, um, even guys that aren't retiring seemed to reflect back on that 2019 Game 7 loss or just that series in general with St. Louis. And I feel like this past season stirred up some of those thoughts again about missed opportunities And this is what he's talking about. He's talking about adjustments that could have been made and should have been made that weren't at the time. And I mean, it's hard to argue that uh, he doesn't have a case with that. He and Pasternak have always worked well together and it might've spread the wealth, so to speak. Obviously you do have that hole on the first line then, but it's where it was worth trying. And um, it certainly wasn't going to hurt the, production of Krejci's line, it was going to boost um, his ability to, to contribute and, and help out. And uh, I mean, obviously, when we talk about a, a team that loses in game seven, 
there's so many things you can point to throughout a series, but maybe that would have made the difference. Yeah, it's a difficult situation. I think, um, I mean, part of me wants to say that management, um, you know, failed that season not providing. I mean, well, you know, I say that, but they brought in Johansson and Coyle, and those guys at the deadline were excellent. So I don't want to say that Sweeney failed at that deadline because he he bolstered the team, and I think those two played a massive role in getting to the cup finals. Still, they yeah, they were a top six winger short. Um, I think there's definitely merit to Bergeron and Marchand can carry a line themselves, no matter who the third person is, whereas, you know, Krejci could have benefited from Pasternak. But I, you know, I think... At the time, the Bergeron, Krejci, Pasternak, uh, or uh, the Bergeron, Marchand, Pasternak combination at that time had been going strong for three years and was the biggest driver behind that team's offensive success. And, you know, in hindsight, you look back at a line with two thirds of a line being David Krejci and Jake DeBrusque, that seems good enough to me to drive a line. Um, so I look at Jake DeBrusque and I think he was quiet and Krejci was quiet. So the two of them being together, I think is, you know, uh, they should look at themselves for being quiet in that series. I mean, yeah, passion that probably helps them. Sure. Of course. But, um, you know, I just have a tough time. I still think that Bruins team was more talented, uh, more talented up front than, than that, that blues team, not by much. I think that blues team as time goes on, I do think that they were better personnel wise. And than I gave them credit for going into that series. I think their size in the back end was huge. Bennington oh, played Rask at times, but, um, Look, it's it's a it's a fair thing for Krejci to wonder, but at the end of the day, it's like if I, if there's a criticism for me with Cassidy in that in that game seven, it would be going with Kuhlman over. Um, and I've said this before, but like I I know David Backus wasn't a huge offensive player in Boston, but something something tells me that him being on the ice in a game seven situation against a team that he captained for a chance to win a Stanley Cup. Something tells me he would have been pretty goddamn motivated and maybe a puck was off his skate and the Bruins get a lead in that game. I don't know. So I understand Krejci's criticism regarding putting Kuhlman on his line, a guy who played probably 15 games for them in the regular season and like a couple of games in the playoffs. I get that for sure. Um, but I don't know. The, the Bruins just over the years, like to, to look back at that one game, it's bullshit because at the same time they got outplayed in game two. They got outplayed in game five, both on home ice. You lost three of the last four games on home ice in that series. You lost three straight games on home ice in that series. So, Which was their demise this year, too. They played some of the worst hockey. I've, the the yeah. worst hockey I'd seen them play all year was those home games in the playoffs. The war, Easily the worst hockey I'd seen them play the whole year. I mean, if you're if you're David Krejci and, and in 20, by the time 2019 rolls around, you have your player – who is so accomplished in the National Hockey League that you're you're a Stanley Cup champion. You were a former first line center on a Stanley Cup championship team. You twice led the postseason in scoring in 2011 and 2013. You should be able to drive a line on your own in, in that situation. And I think that's what the Bruins trusted that he could do. So I understand that not having one of the best goal scorers in the world on your line isn't optimal, right? Um but David Krejci was established enough at that point in his career um, to, 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 to be better in that series with or without Pasternak. And Jake DeBrus didn't show up either. So, look, as a player, I understand he's going to feel that way. He has the right to. Um, but, but, I, but everybody has to wear an egg on their face uh, from, that, from that series. And I, I and, think they do. Like, they genuinely do. Like, um, yeah. and that's and, but Bridget, like and that's on them. That's why also, Bridget, I felt like this past year going into the postseason, they wouldn't have let what happened happen because they weren't just a great regular season team that like got surprised or, or, or overwhelmed by the expectations. Like that Bruins team last year, they had a ton of leadership. They had a ton of experience, skill, and grit. And they have learned those hard lessons before, which is why I was so confident that they weren't going to let you know, a half ass, no disrespect to the Panthers, but like, I just, that, that roster was top heavy and I'll, I'll stand by that until I'm blue in the face, that Panthers team um, yeah. to let that happen to them this past year was unacceptable. But as far as the 2019 thing, Scott, 
Krejci has he has a gripe for sure, but if I'm Cassidy, I'm also talking to my players, being like, you know, be better. Yeah, and I mean the the one necessary rebuttal that I always make and will make on you know Coleman versus Bacchus is Bacchus had other chances to play in that series and did not play well, and Coleman had just scored a big goal and a really nice goal in Game Six. So I also get why it would be hard to take him out after scoring that goal. Um, you know, really th- like there's so much you can second guess and wonder about. Like I, I always wonder, you know, if what if he had tried Marcus Johansson at second line right wing for a more extended stretch at some point, not that I think that would have been ideal. Not that that's really the best spot for Marcus Johansson, but would he have been a better fit there than, you know, everyone else they tried would have, what is kind of, like that, just the way he played, like that go go style, would that have maybe brought something, a spark to that line that other guys couldn't? Um, but they liked his chemistry with Coyle so much that you kind of kept together that strong third line and just hoped something would click on on the second line, and it really never did. I mean, really, like if you're looking at that trade deadline, you're you're right that Sweeney did make you know two significant additions, but probably it's easy to say in retrospect, but probably you know, the second deal after Coyle probably had to be someone who was a little bit more of an impact player than, than Johansson, something closer to a surefire second line winger. But, um, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's in the past now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it also worth noting, like Krejci was actually a, a plus player in that series. So even though he wasn't putting up points, like that line also wasn't, getting abused like they weren't getting scored on left and right the the first line the bergeron line was on the ice for way more goals against like they were the ones who had minus fives and minus sixes next to their names for that series so um you know you you need someone else to step up if that if that line's not scoring a ton or breaking even someone else has to be the offense and then come out you know even more on the plus side um, and that's where obviously that second line and really every other line came up short was, yeah. you know, sure they could go out there and play hard and break even, but no one could really score consistently at five on five. Yeah. But if that, if that top line's being adequately defended, then splitting Posnock away from that line makes sense even more. So, I mean, obviously we're going back and, and it's funny because thinking back on the way that, Cassidy coached through that entire playoffs and the difference with Montgomery uh, this playoffs kind of overdoing it and making too, too many moves and moving too many pieces and kind of creating um, uh, a panic uh, a little bit and like, okay, well, why, why are we making so many adjustments? Are we nervous? Are we like overthinking things? And they're just two different ways that it went wrong in game sevens that have been painful for people. And Krejci in particular has, spoken to both of those things and really has been thinking about both of those things and reflecting on his career. Can I guys correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, the last two NHL postseasons that David Krejci has been a part of with the Bruins, they gave him David Pasternak on his wing. Am, am, am I mis- am I mistaken about that? The Islanders series was 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 pasta not with Krejci in that series, and that they, they they had to give him back to Bergeron and Marchand because they were kind of like in trouble. Um, I don't think so. maybe for like a shift here and there, but Krejci was more with Taylor Hall and Craig Smith okay. that that run. But th- there might have been like a little juggling here and there. Well. Yeah, I mean, I guess my point is ultimately they've had they've had opportunities with 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 Pasternak and and certainly this past year. And I know Krejci was down for a couple of games in the in the, in the playoffs, but you know, Game Seven against Florida, like you had you had the dream scenario if you're Krejci. So um, I, I think it's more than a Krejci conversation. Like I understand, I'm not going to criticize his opinion. Like he's lived it for 16 years in Boston. He's been through it all. He's won a championship with Boston. Um, he has the the right to feel however he wants to feel about something that he lived through. And we just spectated. Um, but what I will say is like, you know, unfortunately this is, you know, when we talk about it, you, you, Scott, you mentioned like in that series against St. Louis. Yeah. It was more, it was more uh, Bergeron 
and, and Marshan kind of getting out and, and Pashnak getting outplayed by St. Louis's top line. And and it's so it's more of a it's more of a Krejci thing in here. It's more of a it's it illustrates how outside of 2011, this this Bruins team just found ways to to not 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 come through when it mattered most. And and it's part of you know their Hall of Fame, you know. Hockey Hall of Fame players, not necessarily Krejci, but Bergeron is. Pashnak, if he goes, keeps going at this pace, will be a Hockey Hall of Famer. Uh, Brad Martian is a case to be made for him. Tuga Rask, um, Zdeno Char, obviously. Um, and they're all Bruins Hall of Famers. But with 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 those expectations, you know, you, you expect more, right? And uh, It they sucks just, to they, boil they, it down to that, though, because, like, that was one of the most entertaining playoff runs. Like, that was some of the most entertaining hockey I witnessed. Like, there were some really uh, fun games and moments and uh, definitely a lot of belief throughout that playoff series the Bruins were going to find a way to win the Stanley Cup. So um, I just remember Let's thinking see. about that run as a whole in 2019. Oh yeah, thinking that they had put together a roster that's good enough to win it. That what they had been doing was enough to. And then you you get it on home ice. You're like, well, it's home ice. But then, uh, yeah, no, it obviously did not play out that way. A lot of people in Boston say, stop talking about Game Seven. We forgot about that and we threw it out of our memory and it never happened. And I don't even know what you're talking about. 2019. We were we were away that year. I don't know, um, but, but yeah, I mean, that was one of the most fun times I've had watching hockey. So it, was, it sucks that it turned out that way, but like on the it was ride, great. it was. Fun. You know what though? That you know that's what they had. It was amazing, but they also had the former uh, defending Stanley Cup champions eliminated in Washington, and mm-hmm. you had and you had Tampa Bay, who at the time set the 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 wins record bounce in the first round to Columbus. So, you know, the path was, was there from them from the jump after the first round. And, but ultimately whatever, it's <laughs> great, great era of Bruins hockey. They brought a cup back, great players, all the, all these things, but it's always something for the most part. And, you know, this, this situation, we're talking about game seven, St. Louis could pass back up with great chief, maybe, but you know what? <laughs> time and time again, there was, there was always something that this team just found a reason to lose. So, um, you know, but anyway, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Well, I'm sorry, but it's it, look, I don't I don't I don't go into these conversations expecting to bring this up. But you know, it's I hear Krejci pretty much more or less like throw Bruce Cassidy under the bus for them not winning the Stanley Cup in twenty in twenty nineteen because of a one game decision or, or or. But it's like, how many opportunities have you guys had to to, to where, you, where the team was good enough to win a cup and 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 you know whatever. So I just don't like Cassidy being blamed for that. It's just. It, the players, the players should have performed better in that series. Bottom line, especially in Boston. Yeah, I mean, right. Like it, it's not Cassie's fault that Martian changed off. You know, with whatever five seconds left in the period. Um, yeah, you, you're right. Ultimately, of course, it's on the players, and you know, you so much, so much, so many things to like second guess and just wonder what if in that series, you know. Well, like, what if Grizzly doesn't miss time? You forget that he was playing really good hockey before, you know, a pretty dirty hit. Um, I think that was Sunquist, right? Oscar Sunquist um, misses three or four games in the final. Zidane Chow with the broken jaw, which, you know, creates one of the most inspirational moments and in just about as loud as I've ever heard the garden when he gets introduced. Um but he also wasn't able to really be him, his usual dominant self after that. His, his minutes were a little bit limited, and you could tell when he was on the ice that understandably there was an effort to, you know, avoid some contact. And I don't think he got exposed or anything, but, like, he wasn't usual Zidane Chara. So, yeah, you, you wonder about all of it. And unfortunately, like, you, you saw the absolute best hockey Jordan Bennington is ever going to play. He has not been an elite goalie since then, even though he's getting paid like one. Um, but that happens. Goalies goalies get hot. We just saw it with Vegas and Aiden Hill, who's not an elite goalie either, but just got hot at the right time. I mean, I'll I'll give you game seven for a little bit there, Scott. But like that game you just mentioned, the 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 Chara broken jaw standing ovation. How do you go out there? And you're losing two nothing with like eight minutes left in the game, and you score on a fluky Jake DeBrusque like slap shot, which he's never even taken in his NHL career besides that one time, and it squeaks through Bennington. It's like 
that's kind of what I'm driving at. Like, how do you have the garden ovation like that? And there's chills up and down your spine and you're watching your leader play a game where he shouldn't be even on the ice. And, 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 you know, people talk about the Noel Achari, you know, non trip call and that leads to a goal, but it's like, that was with like, you know, 12 minutes left in the game and the Bruins hadn't scored a goal yet. It's like, how does that, how does that happen? How do you not be better in that situation? Like, how do you not score? Because I don't remember St. Louis being like, you know, that, that dominant in that game or Jordan Bennington for that matter. So whatever, just missed opportunities. But, um, but yeah, let's, let's go back to, to Czechia where, uh, where nobody's like, you know, paying attention much and we'll just throw Cassie into the bus again, but it's all good. I'm paying attention. They, were, yeah, paying they, were, attention. they forgot that Scott can speak Czech. They yeah. forgot that he can read and, and he's right on top of it there. By the way, though, there are Czech reporters that cover the team throughout the year that I like, they will be at games and all of a sudden, like last question goes to this Czech speaking person. And then we're like, Oh, okay. I guess we, got, we, we've had uh Czech reporters follow the team. Um, speaking of David Krejci in that blue series, we talked about how his line mate was Jake DeBrusque. Scott, there was one final thing you wanted to cover uh, regarding his future potentially in, in a, in a NHL comparable, maybe. Yeah. Well, so we haven't I talked about this. Work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we haven't talked about this a ton, but like it, it's going to be a topic at some point now or in the not too distant future, but Jake DeBrusque is entering the final year of his contract one year left, $4 million, unrestricted free agent after the season. Um, obviously just had the best season of his career. So I do think like it's a worthwhile conversation to start to think about what does his next contract look like? What it, What is his future? Obviously, this was kind of the, you know, two-year, basically a bridge deal after all the crap with the trade request and a down season. And we know, you know, he had a tough time during COVID and, all that. And this was sort of like, all right, he was starting to get back on track at the time. He had moved up to the top line, you know, here's something to kind of ease your mind and let's see where it goes. Well, where it's gone is he's played really well since then. Um, and I think there was a comparable Tuesday morning uh, where the Tampa Bay lightning signed Brandon Hagel to an eight year extension worth six and a half million a year. And, the reason I say that's a comparable is that they basically had identical stats on a per game basis last year. Um, points per game. They were like within fractions of each other. Uh, Hagel was 0 0.79 points per game. And DeBrusque was 0 0.78. Um, you know, I actually, I think DeBrusque is actually a little bit more of a complete player adding in the defensive improvements he made last season. Um, with Hagel, Tampa was also buying out some restricted free agency, which, you know, Hagel would not have been an unrestricted free agent after this upcoming season, which means there was still a little bit of team control there. So if anything that plays in their favor a little bit, um, so I look at that and I wonder, like, is that the kind of contract DeBrusque is potentially looking at? You know, we don't know how long he's going to want to go or how long the Bruins want to go, but eight years, six and a half million. DeBrusque is, is two years older, but still, obviously, you're not talking about, you know, an older player. You're talking about someone who's 26 going on 27. So I do think, like, you, if he wants to stay and the Bruins want to keep him, you could be looking at something like that, you know, seven, eight years, six and a half million dollar range, maybe even. More than that, especially if it lingers into the season and DeBrusque, you know, gets off to a good start, like I, I could see it even going up from there potentially. So if you were to think about the timeline for something like that to happen, like are you it sounds like you're thinking in season they're gonna try to wrap that up sooner than later, um, an extension on him, or what would you think? Like, did they let him play off the season? Do they risk going to free agency do they like do they see him as someone that they need to make a priority right now to sign well i think first you, you have to know what the commitment level is from debrusque's end because it wasn't that long ago that you really had no idea what the commitment level was i think if you're confident that you're going to get the jake debrusque you got last year 
I'd be trying to get it done now. Like, I, I guess the one reason you might let it linger is you want to see what he does without Bergeron there anymore. You know, we know Bergeron and Martian have been big for him the last couple of years. He talked about that openly when, when he was on the podcast. Um, but he still has Martian there. And DeBrusque himself said Martian's the one who's, you know, the hardest on him and always on his ass if he takes even, you know, half a drill off. Um, so I would say, you know, as, as long as there's mutual interest and you're fairly confident that you can get that Jake DeBrus going forward, I'd be trying to get it done now because I think if you if you do wait into the season, then you do risk him getting off to, you know, a strong start and the price going up. So um, if I were the Bruins, I'd at least be initiating those conversations and maybe they already had. And if there was a deal to get done before the year, uh, I would do it, but you don't, I don't think you don't want to, to let it get to free agency. Like to me, that raises the possibility of, you know, if, if it's not done by like trade deadline time and say the Bruins aren't really looking like much of a contender, then you have to seriously consider trading them because I wouldn't want to risk losing DeBrus for nothing. Like no matter what people think of him, he's a player's real value. You know, he was on 35 to 40 goal pace last year. Um, when you factor in the in- the time you missed due to injuries, so um, and there's a lot of teams at that time of year that are looking for a, a top six winger. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, you know, and it's not those plays aren't easy to replace. We we're already talking about how we think the Bruins are, you know, at least one or two top six forwards short. Well, if you let DeBrus go or you trade him away, then you're another top six forward short. So. Yeah, I think uh, I, what concerns me with him is his ability to stay healthy. If you go, if you look at his game logs um, over his career, he he's only logged seventy games at most in a regular season, and um, oftentimes it's it's well below that. So health is a is an important factor for him going forward. Can he stay healthy? Um, you know, he, his career high in points is fifty. It was this past year in only sixty four games. So to your point, Scott, like he was on a great pace this year. Look, I think at the end of the day. DeBrusque is probably at at most a 60 point guy, you know, maybe a 65 point guy one time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think if he, if he wants the, I don't think he has a ton. I think the Bruins have more leverage here than he does based on his, his, his historical statistics and health. Um, I think he's, he has to prove it a lot more than he probably has consistently to really try to break the bank with Boston. And you know what, if they can't, if they can't agree, then yeah, they should get him. They should trade him for some value because uh, Jake DeBrusque is. Um, I don't think they should overpay for him long term at all. Not based on what he's provided in his career. I mean, it, the last couple of years before he went to Bergeron and Martian, we were talking about what happened to this kid. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll see how that one plays out. Um, I think that he'll. I, I think he's. In, yeah, that that's how I would say it. I want to see more from him, and especially to your point, Scott, without Bergeron and Krejci, like, can he carry a line? Can he can he be a sixty point guy? in a healthy 82 game season without those guys around them, I guess we'll find out. Well, th- let me put you on the spot then. Let's say it's this exact deal that Hagel just got eight years, six and a half million a year. That's on the table right now. Would you sign DeBrusque to that contract? Um, no. I really, no. I really don't know. I, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't, I don't trust that he's going to be that great of a player in eight years from now at that cap hit. Um, I don't know. I, I, I there's there's something there's something off with his with his makeup as a player. I just don't trust him eight years from now, if I'm being honest. I think so. eight years is too long for him. Like you mentioned, Hagel's two years younger as well. So, um, I mean, you're not. I wouldn't be trying to sign DeBrus to the maximum term that a team can sign. So I don't think he's I don't think he's earned that right to be honest with you. No. Like, I, I, for, based on his base, if you look at his career logs and like just like the numbers he's put up and the games he's played and you know and, and the, the trade request with the coach, like what happens if he gets another coach doesn't like right? So like I just I, he, to me, like I get he was on pace for 35, 40 goals maybe this year, Scott. It was a it was a record year for everybody. Um, I don't think he's earned that um consistently enough throughout his career he's shown flashes but not enough he needs to he needs to develop more as a leader in my opinion if you're gonna give him eight more years would do you think he would not even consider deals like do you think he's looking for that long a deal or would he be cool with like a five-year like 
five-year extension, four-year extension? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a good question, but potentially if you're going shorter on years, then the AAV might have to be higher. I mean, there's like there's some metrics that put like DeBrus's value in terms of what he did last year at like eight million plus, which I certainly wouldn't give him that. But I would sign him to eight by six and a half right now, just because I think I think it's pretty much the going rate for good, but not not truly great top six wingers right now and going forward. Like I just think that's the same AAV that Tom Wilson just got. And I'll, I think Jake DeBrus is a better player than Tom Wilson. I'll, I'll take him over Wilson. Yeah, but We also talked about how stupid that contract was last week. Yeah. And Wilson's also even Wilson's three years older than DeBrus. So do you actually think he's a, do you think when, when Tom Wilson is playing at his best, you think Jake DeBrus is better than him as, as far as what he brings on a game? I don't think so. I, I think I he's do. a better than Wilson. I think at this point in both of their careers that DeBrusque's better, but I do think no, that no, Wilson... no, no, no. right now you're right. Yes. Right now DeBrusque is, I'm just saying like at, at Wilson's peak, I, I think he's better than what DeBrusque has brought Boston well, to this. I mean, I think DeBrusque is better right now. And I also think if you're projecting forward on a seven or eight year deal, yeah. I'll take DeBrusque through his late mid to late twenties and early thirties. And yeah, you're going to have, you know, maybe a year or two there on the end where he starts to decline at age you know, 33 or whatever it is. But um, I would take DeBrusque at eight by six and a half over Tom Wilson at seven by six and a half any day. Of the yeah. Week. Cause I mean, really all we need to think about is the future. Not, not like what Tom Wilson was like back then, yeah. but like, yeah. it, I think it'll be interesting because I mean, he's not going to be completely old by the end of an eight year contract. So it just depends what they're willing to do and, and what, and it is just funny to me that two seasons ago it was like, how quickly can we get him out the door? And now it's like, can we sign him to an eight year extension after we already signed him to a two year extension? And like, he, what if he ends up being in Boston the rest of his career after requesting a trade? Like he ends up in Boston for 10 years after that. Yeah. I mean, he, look, I, I mean, Scott, I, I guess I would sign him to that deal right now. Um, because there, there is that philosophy of like sign now, trade later. I mean, maybe, maybe you could, maybe you could shake that contract at some point down the line. I don't know, but um, I mean, he's definitely a need right now. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I, I'm not trying to actively move him. I mean, they, they, they need top six talent. And he is that, right? So I'm not just trying to ship him out of here, but um, just going to see a little bit more of him. I want to see him stay healthy um, and be and be a bigger role when 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 the big boys are no longer around. Um, so especially up front and Marshan's. Marshan's got probably a couple of years left at most anyway, right? So he's really got to take those steps as a leader. And he hasn't really been a great leader in his youth. That can change. But he stepped up the last year and a half for sure. Uh, Bridget, we know you have uh, a busy schedule with uh, with work. so um, Yeah, I work every freaking day now. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to every Italy next Red week. Sox so team. No. No one should feel bad for you. Bridget's going to Italy. Come on, next guys. Week. Feel a little bit bad. I haven't slept. The Red Sox games have been getting over at like midnight. I've been getting home at like 1 30 in the morning. Tired guys. A little cranky. <laughs> but I am going on vacation in five days. <laughs> so and then yeah, you guys, it's up to you guys for about two weeks. Yeah, yeah. well, so I guess while we're here, we should mention our next episode probably won't be till like maybe later next week, because I also have, as people can see on my hat here, Jimmy Fund, Radio mm-hmm. Telethon uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday. So people people should listen. People should donate. Obviously a great cause. Um, but that will also tie up about 40 hours on back-to-back days. So yeah. I don't think we'll be recording early next week, but maybe maybe later next week, there'll probably be some interviews to react to. Usually you know, there's at least one or two Bruins guests during the Radio Telethon. So mm-hmm. um yeah, people people should should listen and donate. All right. Do that. Hockey's around the corner, guys. We're getting there. Slow but steady. We're getting there. So um, if you guys have nothing else, Bridget will let you go. Scott and I, I guess we'll get back to, to work that we're already <laughs> See the listeners and viewers in two and a half weeks. <laughs> all right. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you very soon. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist.
Not in front of a screen. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our 